Welcome to the next lecture in the Understanding Crypto series. This lecture is going to cover Bitcoin Core, the reference implementation of Bitcoin. Um, in particular, I'm going to dive into Bitcoin Core. I'll talk about Bitcoin from development environment perspective. I will talk a little bit about why run a Bitcoin node and also talk about the RPC API. Bitcoin Core is the reference implementation of the Bitcoin system. Um, you know, Bitcoin is an open source project and that source code is available under an open MIT license, uh, free to download and use for any purpose. Open source means a lot more than simply it's free uh, to purchase. It also means that Bitcoin is developed by an open community of volunteers. At first, that community it consisted of only Satoshi Nakamoto back in 2008. Uh, but by 2016, Bitcoin source code had more than 400 contributors with about a dozen developers working on the code almost full time and several dozen more on a part time basis. Anyone can contribute to that code, including you. And, you know, all open source projects are looking for volunteers. So please feel free to volunteer. Uh, when Bitcoin was originally created by Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that is or whoever they are, uh, the software was actually completed in 2008 before the white paper was released and uh on halloween of 2008 satoshi wanted to make sure that the bitcoin software worked before actually writing his white paper his or her white paper about it that first implementation is then simply known as bitcoin or the satoshi client has been heavily modified and improved over the years uh, today's code base is many times longer than the original code base. Um, and the software has evolved into what today is known as Bitcoin Core to differentiate it from other compatible implementations. Uh, Bitcoin Core is the reference implementation of the Bitcoin system, meaning that it's the authoritative uh, reference on how each part of the technology should be implemented. Uh, Bitcoin Core implements all aspects of Bitcoin, including wallets, a transaction, and a block validation engine. Uh, as well as a full network node in the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network. Uh, one comment on that wallet, though, even though Bitcoin Core includes a reference implementation of a wallet, uh, it is not our recommendation that you should use a Bitcoin Core wallet uh, as a production wallet for users or for applications. Instead, you're advised to use a wallet that uses modern standards such as uh, BIP39 and BIP32, on uh, monomic code world, words and HD wallets, which I will talk about in a future lecture. Uh, but I will show you some examples of the Bitcoin Core um, in a few minutes. Taking a look at our diagram on the Bitcoin Core architecture, um, you can see in this diagram that uh, everything within the dashed line is uh, part of Bitcoin Core. And then outside uh, the Bitcoin Core, uh, to the top above peer discovery, you see peer to peer network, where this particular Bitcoin core node communicates to other uh, Bitcoin nodes. And then on the right hand side next to RPC, which is short for the RPC API, you see um, um, a uh, pink app communicating to the RPC API, uh, indicating of course that um, applications can use the RPC API to do stuff on uh, the Bitcoin node, whether they're you know calling uh, functions to do something or they're just trying to read some information. Um, how applications interact with Bitcoin nodes is through this RPC API, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, taking a quick look at some of the uh, items that are shown in this diagram, many of which I'll talk about in this lecture or pre uh, subsequent lectures. Um, over on the left hand side, we got peer discovery where we're discovering other peers in the network that we're going to communicate to. Uh, both peers will be listening to as well as peers will be reaching out to. Um, below that, we have a little database. Once we discover a peer, we'll store information about that peer in our little database on peers. And we have a connection manager that's responsible for making connections. Uh, then there's the wallet, as we mentioned, and the RPC. Below the connection manager, we have transactions and blocks. So basically, peers will be sending us transactions and blocks. Um, those transactions go into a mempool. Um, once we receive the transactions and blocks, they'll be validated using the validation engine. And what the miner will do is it will pull those transactions that have been validated, use those transactions to build a candidate block, and then it will start looking for a proof of work solution for that candidate block. 
uh, as other peers in the network send uh, blocks to that have uh, solutions to our node, our validation engine will then validate those blocks to verify that the block does have a valid solution. If it does, we'll add it to our list of blocks and we'll stop mining the current block and we'll then uh, look for a solution to a block that follows the newly received valid block. Over in the right hand side, we got a storage engine. Here we sell block headers and blocks and coins. All right, so that's a brief look at the Bitcoin core architecture. Um, as I mentioned, Bitcoin's open source. We can uh, pretty much download it from anywhere, uh, but here are several places I recommend uh, going to. Um, you can get the latest version on github.com at Bitcoin Bitcoin. Um, you can also download it from Bitcoin org, uh, Bitcoin core or Bitcoin core.org. Um, now, whichever one you go to, I highly recommend that you validate the download to verify that, um, you know, you, you got a copy of Bitcoin that was not hacked by a hacker. Um, taking a quick look at uh, some of these websites. Um, here is the Bitcoin uh, core uh, web page on Bitcoin.org. Uh, you know, Bitcoin.org was the original website that Satoshi Nakamoto put up. And today you can download Bitcoin Core here on the download link, uh, you know, and scroll down and they show you the latest version, 0.21.1. Uh, they also have uh, some links to what the features are, documentation, forums, and some other aspects of working with uh, Bitcoin Core um, we can also go to uh, the website that's specific for Bitcoin Core, which is over here, bitcoincore.org, um, and it gives you some aspects of development, how you can contribute, how you can participate, various frequently asked questions about some of the uh, things that have gone on in terms of the SegWit, and, uh, various information on re releases and blogs, and you got the download page there, as well as um, you know, talk with the links to the different OSs, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and so on, as well as what you need to verify that you have downloaded a release that has not been hacked. So here, for example, are various release uh, signing keys, um, a link to download it using Torrent, and so on. A uh, little mention the fact that, you know, about the bandwidth in space for Bitcoin, um, you know, how you verify it and so on. All right. So that's a look at how you, where you would go to download it here, by the way, is the GitHub site. It's at Bitcoin uh, core uh, up at uh, github.com slash Bitcoin dash core. Uh, we have several different re uh, repositories up here, uh, but basically like Bitcoin core, the website is up here. Some of the others, a script debugger, C operations, a lot of the Bitcoin core, core code is written in C++. So you'll see numerous references to C++. But here's the various repositories. All right. Um, let's get back to the slides. All right. So I showed you a couple uh, different uh, examples, how you can install it. The actual installation directions are going to vary quite a bit depending on what operating system you're using. Um, so, for example, here's a couple options you can use if you're using Linux. Um, I'm going to skip through uh, the aspect of installing it and let you figure out how to install it based on, you know, following one of those websites I showed you. They all have instructions for the various OSs. Um, so why should you run a node, though? Uh, well, there's a number of different reasons why you might decide to run a Bitcoin Core node. Uh, you know, if you think about it, Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network has thousands of network nodes run by volunteers and businesses that are building Bitcoin applications. Maybe they have a business that uses Bitcoin, maybe they're mining, whatever it is they're doing, they've decided to run a node um, and uh, be part of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And their node is, you know, has a local copy of all the Bitcoin transactions, and that's independently validated by their own node. Uh, so by running on a, a, your own node, you don't have to rely on a third party to validate a transaction. And you're also contributing to the Bitcoin network, making the Bitcoin network more safe and more robust. Um, however, it does require a system that's connected to the internet and with enough resources to process all the Bitcoin transactions. 
Um, you may also need a fair amount of disk space and RAM. Um, generally speaking, um, a full index node needs at least two gigs of RAM and at least 400 gigs of disk space. Bitcoin nodes also transmit and receive Bitcoin transactions and blocks, consuming a significant amount of internet bandwidth. If your internet connection is limited, has a data cap or is metered, you know, charged by the gigabit, you probably shouldn't run a Bitcoin node or run in a way that uh, keeps the bandwidth uh, low. Um, you know, keep in mind every node of Bitcoin core uh, run by default is going to keep a full copy of the blockchain with every transaction that's ever occurred in the Bitcoin network since January of 2009. Uh, this data set is, you know, very large and it's downloaded incrementally over days or weeks, depending on the speed of your CPU, the speed of your hard drive, your internet connection, and so on. Uh, Bitcoin Core won't be able to process transactions or update account balances until the full blockchain data set is downloaded. So you want to make sure you have enough disk space, bandwidth, and time to complete the initial synchronization. Uh, you shouldn't expect to be able to use Bitcoin Core the same day you download it uh, because it's going to have to go through the synchronization time. Um, you can configure Bitcoin Core to reduce the size of the blockchain by discarding old blocks but it's still going to download the entire data set before discarding data. Uh, but despite these resource requirements, thousands of volunteers run Bitcoin nodes. Some are running Bitcoin on systems as simple as a Raspberry Pi, you know, a, a computer that probably costs under 50 bucks. Many volunteers also run Bitcoin nodes on rented servers uh, using some variant of Linux or Windows. Um, Virtual private servers or cloud computing servers can be used to run Bitcoin nodes uh, depend for a wide range of prices. So why would you want to run a node? Um, here are some of the most common reasons. If you're developing Bitcoin software, you need to rely on a Bitcoin node for the programmable RPC API access that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. Um, the node gives you that RPC API access to the network and the blockchain. If you're building applications that must validate transactions, according to Bitcoin's consensus, uh, then you want to have access to a node. Um, typically, uh, a Bitcoin software company will run several nodes uh, to support its applications. If you want to support Bitcoin, running a node makes the network more secure and able to serve more wallets, more users, and more transactions. Uh, also, if you don't want to rely on a third party to process or validate your transactions. Uh, finally, you might just be doing it for educational reasons. You know, you want to learn about Bitcoin and see how it works. So there are a lot of configuration options you can use with Bitcoin Core. I am not going to go through all of them, but here's a short subset of some of them. You can have commands to uh, send alerts to the owner of the node, maybe by email or by other uh, alerts. You can reduce the amount of disk space requirement by deleting old blocks. You can maintain indexes of transactions. You can specify the maximum number of nodes in the network you're willing to communicate with. You can uh, limit the amount of memory you want to apply. Um, you can set minimum fees for transactions you're going to use when you're mining. Um, you know, you can, you can do a, a number of different configuration options. I'm not going to go through all of them, but that just gives you an idea of what some of the configuration options are like. Um, let's talk about uh, programmable interfaces, in particular uh, application programmable interfaces or uh, the Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has a command line interface where you can type commands in on Linux or um, you know DOS. Um, it also has an API you can use to, to write programs that would interact with uh, Bitcoin, whether the C or C++ or JavaScript or Python clients. Um, there are all the Bitcoin applications like wallets, Bitcoin explorers, block analysis tools, and so on are typically using the API to interact with Bitcoin node. And there are a lot of third party libraries that make it even easier than using the, the Bitcoin RPC API, um, you know, written in all the main programming languages. Uh, a few of the more popular ones are listed here, but there are many, many others besides these.
The uh, Bitcoin Core RPC API can be found at Developer Bitcoin Org uh, Reference RPC. Um, you would also get a copy of it when you install Bitcoin. Um, it's got a number of capabilities to interact with Bitcoin Core. Um, and it refers to these as RPCs, which is short for remote procedure calls. In a way, you can think of this as uh, remote computing because um, your application may or may not be on the same node um, as the Bitcoin Core node. So it might be doing a remote across the network call to that particular node. That's why they're referred to as RPCs. Um, the RPCs do a number of different things. You've got RPCs for the blockchain and for control purposes. You've got uh, RPCs for mining, uh, RPCs for the network, for the wallet, RPCs for creating transactions and uh, and RPCs for utilities and so on. Uh, in fact, why don't we take a quick look at some of those by taking a look at the Bitcoin Core RPC API, which is at uh, developerbitcoin.org. So let me do that. We'll go over here to um, the RPC API reference. All right, so this is Bitcoin develop, developer.bitcoin.org. Um, and it actually has a lot of reference documentation. Here are the, the RPC references. Um, I'll go through them in a minute. I just want to show you a couple other options it has. It's got some nice developer guides here. It's also got some nice references on Bitcoin. So for example, if I click on this introduction tab, it talks about you know the developer reference aims to provide technical details and API information to help you build uh, Bitcoin-based applications. Um, and it recommends using a, the current version of Bitcoin Core. It recommends if you've got questions, go to some of the Bitcoin development communities. Um, you know, if you find errors or suggestions, how to fix, uh, upgrade the documentation, it gives you some suggestions on where you can go. Um, if we look at blockchain, um, here it talks about um, the specification for, uh, you know, some details on how blocks are described. So here are block headers. So a block header begins with a version that's got four bytes. Then it's got um, the hash of the previous block header, which is 32 bytes. Uh, then it's got a Merkle root hash for all the transactions, including this block, which is 32 bytes. And then it's got a Unix time of four bytes. Then it's got a uh, target threshold of four bits and a nonce of four bits. These two are used with the mining algorithm. Um, so basically this is what's in a block header. Um, and then uh, here we see some examples and it talks about how they've, the block headers have, ver have changed over the versions. And it talks a little bit about how the, uh, the Merkle tree and the target are used uh, from an algorithm perspective. And then it talks about how the blocks themselves are serialized. Um, so I'm not going to go through all those details because I do that in a subsequent lecture, but this is a brief little uh, explanation when you're looking at the developer guides of what's going on with the blocks. If we click on the transactions, um, here's our basic documentation. It kind of talks about the opcodes for the transactions. And again, I talk about the opcodes in a subsequent lecture, but basically here it's a subset of the list of all the different opcodes that are out there. There are many other opcodes besides these, but it kind of talks how they work. Also talks a little bit on this page about address conversion and how um, there's some differences in the uh, blockchain addresses. And then it talks about raw transaction format. Uh, Bitcoin transactions are broadcast between uh, network peers in a format that's referred to as uh, it's a serialized byte format that's called raw format. And so that's why you'll see the word raw transactions, because raw is a type of format. Um, and so typically what happens is these raw transactions are actually formatted and encoded as hexadecimal. So if you see hexadecimal, you're probably looking at a raw transaction. And here's just a quick uh, little format explanation of what's going on with these raw transactions. We'll dive into this in more detail in a subsequent lecture on transactions. Um, but then it gives us kind of an example of a transaction input that's not a non coin, that's not a Coinbase, and it shows us what that looks like, and it shows us some outputs. Uh, and gives us some examples and it shows us what's different with a Coinbase input. Um, remember a Coinbase input is the block reward that a miner gets. So the first transaction in a block uh, and every block is typically the Coinbase 
transaction where the miner gets paid. And so it's got a slightly different format, but because it's a, the first transaction, it's pretty obvious to recognize it. All right, so that was uh, explanation on how transactions are formatted. Uh, then they had an explanation on wallets. Uh, and they talk about the differences between the type one wallets and the type two wallets. Pretty much most major wallets are nowadays type two wallets. The type one wallets had some issues um, and are no longer used that much. Uh, then we've got some explanation of the peer to peer network. Um, again, this is a description of the peer to peer network. Um, you know, talking about uh, the main net, which is the production live Bitcoin. And then it's talking about a couple test networks, uh, a test network and a uh, reg test. Um, and then it talks about the protocol versions. Um, and it talks about the how the data messages work. Um, it talks about some of the aspects of how you can get data. So this is actually diving into the API now, talking about some of the calls you can do. Get blocks will give you get uh, certain blocks over the network. Get headers, headers. These are all calls that your Bitcoin node can do to other Bitcoin nodes to get information. And basically, you call those and you get back information. Um, I'm not going to go through all that documentation just to point out that it's there and how the peers work in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So now let's talk about the RPC API reference. Um, so this is a lot of commands. You know, we've got the blockchain API RPCs, there's about 20 of those, about half a dozen control RPCs, only three of these generating RPCs to generate a, blo a block and an address. Then there's about half a dozen mining RPCs, then there's about 10 or so network RPCs. Um, and then we've got about 10 or 15 raw transaction RPCs and about 10 or so utility RPCs. And then there's a lot of wallet RPCs, probably about 40 or so wallet RPCs. And these wallet RPCs are only available if the Bitcoin Core node uh, actually has a wallet deployed on it. Uh, if the wallet hasn't been deployed on it, then those RPCs won't work because there's no wallet to communicate to. All right, so taking a quick look at some of these RPCs, for example, the blockchain RPCs will let you get the, the current block. It'll let you get information on, that, on the blockchain. It'll let you get the current block count, get the block hash, get a block header, and get various stats. So basically think of these as a lot of getters to get current information. Um, but you can also prune the blockchain, you know, reducing the size of the blockchain to save some memory. Uh, you can save your memory pool. So there are a few other commands in here besides uh, just get information commands. The control RPCs have a couple get information commands. They've got a help command, a logging command, uh, and they have a stop command, which will, um, so that's basically what they got. The generating RPC commands have like generate a block, generate an address. Uh, mining RPCs have things like get mining information, get network hash, uh, submit a block. That's important because now you've solved your proof of work problem. We will submit a block that's a candidate uh, for a um, solution. Uh, network RPCs, we have things like uh, get connection count, get net to network totals. So a lot of getters to get information. But we also have disconnect from the network. Uh, we have add node to add node to the network. Um, Raw transaction RPCs. Remember, raw is our format for transactions that we're going to uh, serialize and send across the network. Um, so we have things like create the transaction, create the raw transaction. So this is going to be where we're going to identify um, the address we're sending Bitcoin to, the Bitcoin we're sending, um, any change from that transaction, and who we're sending the change to. That's all that information would go into create raw transaction. Um, sign raw transaction with key. This is where we would use our private key to sign the, the Bitcoin that we're sending to someone else. And if you're using multiple private keys to sign the transaction, you would have to do one of these sign raw transactions for each private key we're doing, using to sign it. Uh, and send raw transaction is when we actually submit that sign transaction onto the blockchain. So the send raw transaction is what we're gonna use uh, to submit the transaction to all the nearby peers, they'll validate it and then they'll pass it on to other nearby peers. And then it'll rapidly propagate across the uh, entire Bitcoin network so that all the nodes out there have a copy of it and can include it in their next candidate block. Uh, and then we got some other uh, commands in here, things like decoders and 
uh, various things about working with these raw transactions. Uh, the utility RPCs is a variety of different utilities uh, for you know validating, sending, and creating, and doing various things, verifying. Uh, and then the wallet RPCs, as I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of these working with a particular wallet. Things like getting a transaction, creating the wallet, dumping the wallet, encrypting the wallet, and so on. Um, take a quick look here at uh, what the Bitcoin Core actually looks like. Here is our Bitcoin Core. Now, Bitcoin Core, when you install, I've inst this is machine is on Windows, and I, when you install it on Windows, you can install both the production version and the test network. And so, this is a test network of Bitcoin Core. I haven't yet installed a wallet. But basically, um, so uh, by default, what you see here is if you want to load a wallet, it tells you where to go to do that, or you can create a new wallet. Um, uh, the BTC, this particular no network is synced. Uh, this Bitcoin Core has been synced, so I'm caught up on all my blocks and transactions, which did take quite a while, multiple days. Um, here's where the file, if you look at file commands, it gives you various ways to interact with a wallet as well as we can load uh, some partially signed transactions to do some more work on those partially signed transactions. Um, what is a partially signed transaction? Well, maybe that's where you have a transaction that requires multiple signatures and somebody else has signed the transaction, but it hasn't been signed by you yet. And so they send you the uh, partially signed transaction. You are then gonna load it into your wallet, you'll sign it, and then you're gonna submit it to the network. Uh, on the settings, we've got things like encrypting your wallet, changing your pass phase, uh, masking the values so people can't see all the values. Uh, also under Windows, you got things like network traffic, viewing your peers, information, the console, um, and then of course, various command line options and a little bit about uh, Bitcoin Core and about Qt, which is a C++ library. All right, so that's uh, a brief look at what Bitcoin Core looks like when you're looking at the test network. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go back to the slides. So we covered um, Bitcoin Core RPC API. So the last thing I want to say is that um, this video and these slides, as well as the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site, which I use to provide some of this contents, is all covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license that you can view a copy of at that particular uh, URL. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for watching this lecture on the Bitcoin Core reference implementation, which is part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett.